No prayer for the dying. Wait. Something feels off. Um, I'm not in the same room as I usually am. Um, I don't have my Iron Maiden jacket on. I'm in my old bedroom back at my mom's house. And I can't even cut away from the screen. I don't have any of my editing technology with me. In fact, I'm recording on my fucking iPhone right now. Something feels off. Maybe it's because something feels off about this album in particular. And, um... I'm gonna have to spurn from the hip with this one because I can't edit or anything. Um, much like Iron Maiden can't uh, produce as solid of a record with this one. No Prayer for the Dying from 1990 is the follow-up to Seventh Son of a Seventh Son back from 1988. And uh, I guess this was their attempt at a more hard rock sort of sound. And... Um, were the results all that good, do you think? Hmm. Not quite. I think this record is a bit mixed overall. Um, I really don't have that much to say about this album. Only I think this is indeed the worst Iron Maiden album in their entire discography. If I had to name the worst... It's this one right here. No Prayer for the Dying is definitely the one. Excuse me. Anyway, um, I just wanted to talk a bit more about this album. So, I apologize for the shitty quality. Um, much like Iron Man should apologize for the not-so-superb quality of this album here. So, yeah, again, No Prayer for the Dying um, was their attempt at a harder rock sound. I guess Steve Harris recorded this in a barn that he purchased, and um, I guess he uh, recorded this in, like, a trailer home, so obviously the production is not up to the standards of the previous albums, any of the previous albums, whether it be Peace of Mind, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, Somewhere in Time, Power Slave, you name it, this definitely does not reach the standards of those albums. Even with Martin Birch still behind the production team, uh, he understood uh, the intention of the band just to produce a harder rock album. So um, uh, he decided to um, just leave it much more stripped down. As you can see by the quality of this review, this is a much more stripped down review in tribute to what Iron Maiden decided to do um, with the album that I'm talking about right now. Um, much of the songwriting quality on this album varies. It's um, definitely not as impressive as the previous album. No, that's just wrong. It's comparing one of their absolute best with uh, their absolute worst, the one I'm talking about right now. <sighs> I feel like um, I'm going in circles telling you sorry for the shitty quality of this review, but again, um, Iron Maiden themselves were going around in circles, just giving off some pretty terrible ideas. Uh, Holy Smoke is uh, a very lame song. I... I don't like that one. It's definitely one of the weaker Iron Maiden songs they've ever done. Same with Hooks and You. Hooks and You is, um, I guess, their third installment in the uh, Charlotte the Harlot series. Um, their first one from the Iron Maiden album, which was pretty cool. 22 Acacia Avenue is by far the best of the trilogy. It's like the Empire Strikes Back of the trilogy, so to speak. And now we have Hooks and You, which, um, you could say is like the, um, the Spider-Man 3 of the trilogy, pretty much. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, um, there, um, this album as a whole, it really isn't terrible, so to speak, but when you compare it to albums like Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, Number of the Beast, Power Slave, yeah, um, those are definitely some very lofty expectations that they were always able to meet before. They were always able to meet and often exceed before in the 1980s, but 
And this time around, they definitely have reached their nadir. It's like Seventh Son of a Seventh Son was their absolute tippity top peak, and then suddenly, uh, boom, they um, s decided to, or not exactly decided, but they just reached their nadir. They reached um, the absolute bottom of the barrel with uh, this one. But again, in comparison to a lot of other albums that I've heard in my life, this album's definitely not among the absolute worst. It's definitely not absolutely terrible because there are some really good songs on here. Um, my favorite of them all is No Prayer for the Dying, uh, the title track. It's a, it's a very nice ballad, and it sort of points to... Um, what they'll be doing later on in the 2000s. It's a it's a very nice melodic piece, and uh, I think Bruce Dickinson gives his best performance on the album. Mother Russia is another great one. Um, man, I guess many people have complained that it could have been like you know the epic of the album, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, the seventh son of a seventh son, the hallowed be thy name, the phantom of the opera for the album. Although, I guess it's uh, much shorter, so really this is the first album since Killers not to have a quote-unquote epic of this album. Although, this song definitely has very epic qualities to it, and um, I think it's, it's definitely fine for what it is. Um, I definitely really enjoy it. Um, another song that I really like is Run Silent, Run Deep. It definitely had. I like the galloping rhythm to it, the dun 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 dun, dun, dun rhythm. Uh, the lyrics are a bit hokey, but I like the vocal performance. I like the musicianship. Um, it's definitely not among like their top tier songs, but I remember listening to it quite a bit, like when I was first getting into Iron Maiden, or when I first uh, heard this album. At least I definitely got into it quite a bit. Um, there's some forgettable ones in here too, like Public Enema number one, except for the song title itself. Uh, uh, I can I can barely recall the chorus of that song. Um, everything else about it, it's just it's very forgettable. It, it doesn't click with me. And when I do hear the chorus, the chorus is pretty fucking bad. I I don't like it. Um, but yeah, Hooks and You and Holy Smoke are. Two of the worst songs on here. Oh, and uh, How Can I Forget Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter, of course. That is, like, the most popular song of this album. I think it's a it's a good song. Um, again, it's no... It's, it's definitely not a top-tier favor. It will definitely not be a, a run to the hills. It will definitely not be an aces high... It will definitely not be a stranger in a strange land. This song is definitely in the bottom tier when it comes to favorite Iron Maiden songs. I don't like the chorus. The chorus is, uh, or I mean, I guess the chorus is decent, but I don't know. It kind of leaves just a weird, sour aftertaste in my mouth whenever I hear it. Um, I don't really care for the song all too much, and um, that's really... All I have to say about it. Um, I guess Fate's Warning... I love the intro to the Fate's Warning song. But everything else about it, it's... Um, I guess it's decent. Eh. But yeah, you could definitely tell that Iron Maiden really took a dip in uh, songwriting and creative quality uh, with this album. Uh, they were writing masterpieces such as the Seventh Son of a Seventh Song like song and album in general, they're writing Number of the Beast, they're writing Peace of Mind, they're writing all these great classics throughout the 1980s, although I guess with this album they're going more towards like the more hard rock, stripped down, like rough and dirty sort of style that a lot of rock bands were employing at this time. I mean, grunge was definitely uh, coming up from the surface by the time 1990s hit around, so um, uh, I guess this was Iron Maiden's sort of attempt at riding the bandwagon, uh, you could say. 
Uh, but not exactly. I mean, you could definitely see a lot of the uh, Maiden elements in this album. They're just... I wouldn't say that they are up to par with any of the classic works and uh, anything that they'll do after this. Um, yeah, I definitely... It's not just... Um, um, not meeting the expectations because I understand seventh son of a seventh son are some lofty expectations to meet, but I mean, they've been, they've been able to top themselves with each and every album in the 1980s. They've been on a roll. They've been meeting and exceeding expectations. Um, I couldn't really see much of a reason why they weren't able to pull it off again in the 1990s. Was it the fact that oh, a new decade's done now? Um, we're in the 1990s, it's a brand new decade, we might as well try something different, or something. I mean, I understand that they want to try a different approach, but I guess it didn't exactly work out the way they wanted it to. And, um, I guess that's really all I have to say about this album. It definitely is the weakest Iron Maiden album, I have to say. Overall, um, I would have to give it about, it would range from about a 6.75 to about a 7 out of 10, just overall. It's a very patchy listen. Um, the great songs, or like the good songs range from decent to um, really good, and um, everything else is just forgettable and bland, and ugh, I don't really care. Um, I guess Tail Gunner's another good one that I forgot to mention. I like that one. But, um, anyway, uh, that's really all I have to mention. Uh, sorry for the more, uh, just the shitty quality of this review, but I guess it suits the, um, nature of the album No Prayer for the Dying in contrast to the 80s releases, so I guess mm, this works out mm, fine, even though I, uh, sound like shit. I'm, like, stuttering and rambling and stuff, but hey, a shitty review I think complements a relatively shitty album, so um, I guess that's all I really have to say about this release, so uh, thank you very much for watching my shitty review on this um, pretty shitty album, and I'll um, talk to you later.